evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jerisa Lamonts, and I am the second vice president for the Hardin County branch of the NAACP. I'm pleased to be here with you today um, in what is our final segment in our series on Black history. Um, today, we are proud to host Dr. Heather Warren, and someone will give her a very nice introduction here later. Um, while I have the floor, I'd like to update the membership and maybe some community members that are on here listening with some important things that we are doing at ECTC to celebrate Black History Month. The first thing I wanna say about our celebration of Black History Month is it does not end in February. Um, in fact, the things that we are doing are there to enforce that Black History Month is actually a part of our American history. We would be nowhere without Black culture, Black, uh, black indebtedness to this country. So um, but some of the things that we are doing right now is we have an initiative called Decolonizing the Curriculum. Decolonizing the Curriculum is, a, is very simple, but very, very heavy. Um, it allows uh, us, our curriculum, to have enhanced diversity and inclusion in two ways. We want to pay attention to course lessons and curriculum to make sure that they're diversified. And we want to, again, to draw some attention to sources, authors, and scholars who may have been underrepresented in, in curriculum. So that, that begins on the 25th. Um, and Michelle, I'll be sure that you get this flyer so that you can share it with the membership and others who may be on the call today. Starts on the 25th with what it means to decolonize the philosophy curriculum. Something else that we're doing at Elizabethtown Community and Technical College is the Beacons of Light celebration. This is our third year of celebration. Beacons of Light was made to help us celebrate local black excellence. This year, we are proud to celebrate three nominees. Ms. Darian Parker, who is with Elizabethtown Independent Schools as well as Terry Bergen, who has been working very hard behind the scenes for our, co our local community's COVID response, as well as Mr. Ed Harris, who has been at 25 years with the college, and we are committing him and honoring for him for his service that he has extended not only to our country, but to our students who have served the country. So we are very proud to honor those beacons of light, knowing that they're illuminating the pathway for, for everyone and for future generations to continue to shine. We also on the 24th are celebrating Black History with Your Life's Blueprint that will be available via Zoom and it will help to celebrate Black History in a holistic type manner. So I'm very, very excited about the things that we are doing. Um, because of my position with the college as Director of Cultural Diversity, we know that the more that we learn about cultures, um, the more that we can, we can gain understanding and empathy for each other. Um, so we want to embrace cultures, not only just African-American cultures, but all cultures. And now we will have an introduction of our speaker by Ms. Lily Bramley. Hello, so welcome everyone. Um, my name is Lily Bramley and I am so honored to have the opportunity to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Heather Warren. Dr. Warren is a biological anthropologist and bioarchaeologist. Her research focuses on the interrelationships among violence, health, health-related care, and differential access to necessary resources, especially as these relate to gender and other issues of identity in the past. Her most recent research is focused on regional conflict and violence in the Mississippian populations from the Middle Cumberland region of Tennessee and identifying potential geophysical or spatial correlates. She's also an excellent professor at the University of Kentucky, who I've had the pleasure to be taught by. Tonight, she will be presenting The Myth of Race, a discussion exploring how race was established to characterize people for economic gains and to justify the enslavement of people with darker skin. Without further ado, please help me in welcoming Dr. Heather Warren. Thank you, Lily. So um, I'm, as Lily mentioned, I'm a biological anthropologist. Um, anthropologists are people who study humans from all different um, aspects of human humanity. But um, as a biological anthropologist, I'm interested in how culture and biology work together to produce um, both biology and culture. They're interrelated. And so I study humans, mostly the biological and cultural um, aspects of humans from the past as a bioarchaeologist. But I'm also really interested in biological outcomes in, um, in health today um, that is impacted by culture and society. And so one of the things that I, um, I like to talk about is to explain to people how the way that we think about race isn't really actually true. Biological race is, is not 
um, it's, it's not a it's not a valid way for us to talk about variation in humans. And so I'm going to talk a little bit how about how um, race is not a valid way to talk about human variation, biological human variation. However, race is real and it does have a huge impact. It's it's significant on its in its impact on humans. Um, and so when I'm explaining to students about how um, race is not a biological um, category, um, they often have questions like, well, okay, fine, if there's no such thing as race, then how come people look differently? And how come uh, biologic, uh, forensic anthropologists are able to determine race on TV shows like Bones? Or if there's no such thing as race, how come I can take a DNA test and it'll tell me who my, where my ancestors come from? And so um, I'm gonna address some of those questions in this talk, but mostly I wanna deconstruct the idea that um, race, is, are these bi race is this biological category that we can use to describe variation. So first of all, the term race means subspecies. So basically um, subspecies, uh, you might be familiar with subspecies of birds, um, breeds of dogs are subspecies, humans don't have subspecies. So even the term race is not a good way to even talk about humans because we don't have subspecies. We are all one subspecies, homo sapiens sapiens. Um, and so the term race is problematic from the outset. Um, we've been using the idea of race the way we think about it today since about the 16th, 1600s. Um, there were a bunch of different reasons for why people came up with these categories and it often had to do with determining who received resources and who didn't to try to um, identify the differences between humans, but it was often used to, um, for, uh, in order to take resources from one group and give them to another, to basically determine which groups of people deserve to have resources and which didn't. Um, and this began in the 1600s by a bunch of different groups, but in particular, um, there were several biological anthropologists. So some of the people who, um, who are my academic ancestors who used measurements of skulls and other uh, body, body measurements to come up with these ideas of how many races existed and what characterized race, how do we define race? And a lot of the information that they gained was used for uh, genetic movement and for uh, justification of a lot of racist scientific, um, scientific racism that exists today. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. But one of the things that's really important is that um, the more we hone in on how we exactly define race, we realize that they don't exist in the way that we think that they do. So the skulls on the top on this slide, the five skulls on the left, were the five races that were defined by um, a German anatomist named Blumenbach, Blumenbach, and he came up with five races. But there is no consensus, even among biologists or scientists who use the, the category of race there's no consensus as to how many races there are. So um, he came up with five, some people use three, um, some people use seven. In a study on um, genetics where they were trying to determine race, they came up with 16 races. In Brazil, there are up to 500 different racial labels that you can use. So if there are that many different races, or if there's that much variation in the way that we describe it, if we don't even know how many races there are, then how can, how can we categorize people in this way? Um, in about the 1970s, a geneticist named Lewontin um, started to try to, he thought that if these races exist, if we have five races or seven races or whatever, and there are these biological categories, he should be able to identify them genetically. And so that's what he tried to do. And he found that he wasn't able to determine discrete categories based on genetic differences. So the idea that race exists in, in these discrete biological categories was not borne out by the, um, by the genetic evidence. Um, genetic studies have shown that, um, that there's actually more variation within groups than there are between groups. And in particular, the, the um, populations with the most amount of variation are groups whose ancestors come from Africa. And that's because um, we first uh, appear in Africa. And so African populations have been around the longest. And so the most amount of genetic variation exists in people whose ancestors come from Africa. And um, the variation that we see between groups is actually minuscule. Most of the variation that we see is found within groups. But I wanted you to think about what some of the characteristics are that we use to determine the race of an individual. So if, a, um, if somebody's describing somebody on the street who's walking by and they try to come up with how it is that we determine the race of somebody, they often come up with um, maybe skin color or hair color or eye color or um, 
facial shapes, the texture of the hair, and all of these things are, are things that people use to uh, identify what, what race somebody belongs to. And so I could, you could actually measure color. And so I could color, I could measure the color of um, everybody's skin and I could make up racial groups based on the color of skin. And that would totally work. I could also do that with eye color or hair color, or anything really. Um, and I could come up with these categories for one characteristic. But if I add any other characteristic in there, it wouldn't work, it would fall apart because not everybody who has a particular skin color also has a particular hair color. Um, and so while we could potentially categorize people based on one characteristic, we can't do it with more than one. And so that makes it really problematic because it means that a lot of the ways that, a lot of the characteristics that people use to determine race, it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't categorize that way. Um, and the reason why it doesn't categorize that way is because most of these characteristics aren't inherited together. So you don't necessarily get the same genes for the texture of your hair as you do for eye color. And so these are independently inherited. So um, you, you may get uh, one type of a gene for your eye color and one type from your hair from one parent, but your siblings may not get the same genes together from the same parent. And so these aren't passed on dependently, they're independently inherited. And there's also not a normal distribution, which means you can see these graphs on the slide for instance, the distribution of skin color does not match the distribution of, na of nose shape or hair color. And so the way that it distributes in the population isn't the same. And so we can't use these together to come up with definitions for categories of race. But one thing we can do is we can look at how, how this variation exists in the world. Like there are differences between people and there are, there's uh, in, Individuals whose ancestors come from one proportion of the of the world probably look different than individuals whose um, ancestors come from another part of the world, and so there's definitely variation. But the variation doesn't categorize into these neat little groups that we can define very easily. A lot of it has to do with um, something called a clinal distribution, and that's where you have these gradations. Um, so, for example, um, skin color. Skin color tends to be darker around the equator. So individuals whose ancestors come from the equator tend to have darker skin color than people whose ancestors come from Northern climates. And a lot of that has to do with um, adaptation to the environment. Um, we, need, um, we need to be able to protect ourselves from UV light and the darker the skin is, uh, your skin is, the better protection you have from UV light. But we also need UV light to, um, to produce vitamin D, and but we also need to be able to protect ourselves from UV. And so the distribution that you see from skin color throughout the world has a lot to do with the UV light that you experience in the world. And they found that the, um, the skin color differences that we see, um, our ancestors, our first ancestors started out with dark skin and the light skin adapted more than once in multiple populations. So we started out with having dark skin and as our population started to move north into northern climates where you have less access to UV radiation um, and more people wear more clothing and stay indoors when it's colder, then they need less protection from the sun and they need more, um, more access to the sun to produce vitamin D. And so the differences in skin color mostly have to do with people um, adapting to an environment where they have less exposure to the sun. Uh, as I mentioned, we need to have access to UV radiation from the sun because it helps us synthesize vitamin D, which we need for our, for strong skeletons. Um, not enough vitamin D can cause um, rickets in children, which is a softening of the bones. Um, and in, in adults, it's called osteomalacia, but it's basically the same thing. Um, but too much radiation, UV radiation can deplete folic acid, which is necessary for DNA synthesis and also the development of the spine. So individual, uh, one of the things that can happen if you don't have enough folic acid is um, your uh, offspring can have spina bifida. And so today, um, pregnant mothers are often given um, folic acid supplements for that purpose. But in the past, we needed to make sure that we could protect ourselves from the UV radiation. So we need enough folic acid, but not too much. So I went into a little bit of the reasons why biological race does not really exist. And it's not the way, it's not a valid way for us to categorize the way variation exists in humans. So even though it does not exist as a biological category, it has enormous social significance. In biological anthropology and, um, and uh, and other social sciences and natural sciences, we think of race as um, a social construct. 
It's a social construct because we made up these categories. They're arbitrary. We decided that races existed. We decided that we wanted to have three or five or seven of them. And we came up with these categories, but they, they didn't exist naturally in the world. We made them up. And so that's why we consider race to be a social construct, something that humans invented and placed on people. And so because it's a social construct, it's important. It's important because people believe that the idea of race is real. And so it has real um, meaning and impact on people's lives because people around them think that race means something biologically. Um, and one of the things that we see is differing health outcomes between populations based on the idea um, that based on the idea that individual, based on all kinds of ideals, and I'm going to talk about a bunch of them in a moment. Some of the differences that we see in um, biological outcomes between um, humans based on racialized groups, so groups that are defined by races that we've made up, but nonetheless we have decided exist. Some of the differences that we see are um, increased, uh, increased hypertension among African Americans, increased um, anxiety and heart disease, differences in cancer rates among different minority groups or different groups in general. And these aren't because of inherent genetic differences between these groups. A lot of them have to do with um, environmental differences. So environmental, um, environmental differences between groups. So where people are located and what um, environmental toxins they may be exposed to. Or um, we know that racism in general can cause a huge amount of anxiety and, um, and anxiety can cause in, um, stress and stress can actually increase um, hypertension. So there are a lot of health um, biological outcomes that are because of race, but they're not because people are biologically predetermined to have them. It's because of the way, the way that they experience the world because of the race that people think that they have, if that makes sense. There's been a lot of studies in um, Puerto Rico where they were looking at specifically um, whether or not it was racial groups that uh, whether the race that you belong to that impacted whether or not you had high hypertension or not. And they found that it wasn't based on the racial groups that people were believed, or people decided that they belonged to, it actually had to do with skin color. And skin color obviously does not cause hypertension, but the racism that people experience based on their skin color can increase stress and actually cause hypertension. And so um, a lot of the diseases and, and health outcomes that we think of as being belonging to particular racial groups, it's not because of genetics. Um, and so this is a, it's an awful, um, square uh, a box that was found in a nursing textbook that described cultural differences in response to pain. And this was, uh, I think, 19, uh, 2007, I think, was when it was discovered. Um, and or maybe, no, it was 2017. It was just a few years ago. So this box belong, was in a nursing book. And so this is hugely problematic because nurses were taking classes from this textbook that was really highly used that describe cultural differences in the response to pain. And that's really problematic because a lot of the biases that doctors may have are actually being taught now. <laughs> They're still teaching some of these ideas that are based on stereotypes, um, coming up with reasons uh, that, that um, different groups may or may not want or need, or maybe you shouldn't offer medication to somebody for pain because they, they like to feel pain, it makes them feel stronger. Or um, they, I'm not even gonna read them, they're very, uh, they're, are horrible and inoffensive, but they are based purely on, on stereotypes. And there wasn't any scientific data to back any of this up. And so when, when it was pointed out, it was immediately removed from the textbook. But this was just a few years ago. I'm pretty sure it was 2017. And so it's, it's not surprising that doctors have biases, doctors and nurses have biases about um, racial groups when they aren't taught that A, race isn't really a, a valid way to, to categorize humans, but, um, but also they're taught that there are these inherent differences that, that are just completely inaccurate. Um, some of the other um, differences that we see in the way that people experience healthcare is um, uh, doctors are more likely to spend more time with patients who look like them. So um, uh, if there are fewer African-American doctors, then you're gonna have fewer African-American patients having as much time as white patients with doctors. And if a doctor spends less time with you, they're gonna spend less time getting a history and they're gonna spend less time trying to figure out a diagnosis. Um, they've also found, you know, there's, there's really high rates of uh, maternal uh, morbidity and also death among black women 
and they found that one of the things that can increase your chances of um, having a, a healthy birth is actually having an African American doctor. And so, and that that mostly has to do with uh, sort of weeding out the bias. It isn't that all white doctors are biased or all doctors are biased against people of um, different racial groups, but it, it does suggest that um, there is some bias that exists. And one of the ways that we can um, cut down on that is to encourage more black Americans to become doctors and increase the, the um, variation of people who, or the diversity of doctors that exist today. One of the other things that I wanted to talk about is, uh, is so a lot of people say, well, if there's no such thing as race, then how come forensic anthropologists can determine race from the skeleton? And so um, I used to be a forensic anthropologist. I'm now um, a bioarchaeologist. So I still study skeletons, but I study, um, I study older skeletons. Um, and in forensic anthropology, some forensic anthropologists do determine race. They recognize that um, race is a social construct. It doesn't actually exist in the way that people believe it to be. But doctors want you to give the race of a skeleton. And um, in the, the narrative that is given in a lot of like uh, missing persons is often they want to know age, sex, height, race of an individual. And so forensic anthropologists are still determining race. I personally don't, mostly because we're not that good at it. So people ask, how come we're so good at it? We're not. We're actually really bad at it. Um, the methods that they came up with to determine race in the skeleton, um, the, the number one way that they use when they're looking at just uh, shape differences in the skull was developed in this one population of skeletons. They came up with this, um, this method of determining race based on this collection of skeletons. And then they tested it on the same collection of skeletons. And it was like a 90 something percent accuracy, which is really good accuracy in skeletal biology. But if you take that same method and use it on any other population, it drops down sometimes as low as like under 20% accuracy, which is, you know, you could flip a coin and do better. So, um, so the methodology doesn't really work that well. Um, you could take measurements. There's some computer programs that use metric analysis of the skull. And um, they use that to basically try to categorize a skull based on different measurements. And that basically, um, it takes your measurements and it compares it to all the measurements in this, um, in this database to see what group do you most closely, uh, do you most closely associate that skull with based on measurements. And that's somewhat useful. It's based on a, on a database and you're basically just trying to see how closely related groups are. But it only works if people who you are closely related to are in their um, database. And the database will categorize anything. So I could measure a baseball or I mean, sorry, a, like a basketball and I could enter those measurements in there. It would still categorize that. So um, just because the machine spits out an answer, it doesn't mean that it's accurate. One of the ways that one of the biggest problems in forensic anthropology and thinking that we are correct in the way that we um, determine race of a skeleton is let's say I have uh, a missing person. Um, I, I have a skeleton and I'm trying to identify them. And I have determined that the individual is male, um, ages 20 to 25. I'm gonna say that they are white and, um, and like five, eight. And so I enter that into a database and if the person exists in my database, I get a check, I got it right. So that's awesome, good job. If the person doesn't exist in the database, then it's not wrong, it's, I just haven't found them yet. So if I got that wrong, if the person was black and I'm searching this database and that person isn't in the database because I told them not to look at the black people, then that is the problem, but it doesn't count as a missing. It, it, just, it doesn't count as an X, it counts as I just haven't figured it out yet. And maybe somebody hasn't reported them missing. And so even in forensic anthropology, like uh, if you see the TV show Bones, they often try to determine race, but it isn't a useful way to categorize humans and it isn't a very uh, helpful way to identify individuals, especially if we're getting it wrong a lot of the time. One of the other questions that I often get um, having to do with uh, if race doesn't exist, then how come I can send my DNA away and figure out, um, and figure out what race a person belongs to? And these recreational genomic companies like 23andMe or Ancestry um, DNA, they, um, they basically have these big databases similar to the, the measuring database for forensic anthropology. And they collect DNA from all over from people who submit their DNA. And so they have this huge database. So when you collect your DNA and compare it to theirs, they'll find the group of people that you look most like based on your DNA. 
So it's completely based on um, comparing your DNA with the DNA that they already have. And so if they don't have a lot of examples of individuals who are closely related to you or whose ancestors come from the same place, then they aren't going to be very accurate in the way that they, um, they determine where your ancestors come from. They don't necessarily determine race, they determine ancestry. So um, it's most likely that based on your DNA that your ancestors come from a particular region. And so it is useful if people who, uh, if your ancestors are, your ancestral groups are represented in their databases, but they often aren't. For instance, there was a, a woman who was from Korea, she was born in Korea, she um, is Korean. And so she submitted her DNA and they came back with her being European. And it was because the variation of her DNA didn't match the very small sample of Korean individuals of DNA that they had in there. And so if you're, if people who come from the same area or have the same genetic variation as you do aren't in the database, you're not gonna be defined. Um, it's also highly inaccurate. They had a case where triplets, identical triplets all submitted their DNA to the same company, but at different times. And they all got different, um, they all got different results. So they say like a certain percentage of your family comes from this region of, of uh, England and, and another portion comes from Ireland and whatever. It came up with this reading of where their ancestors come from, but they each got different results. And the reason for that is that they submitted their DNA slightly um, apart from one another and more, uh, more data was coming in from other people submitting their DNA. And so because it's comparative, it, it can change all the time. It also depends on whether or not uh, people, people are submitting their DNA whose ancestors come from the same place as you do. We were talking earlier before we started this talk, a lot of minority groups have very good reason to be skeptical of giving their DNA to anybody. Um, and there's a lot of really good reasons uh, for, um, for being skeptical of doctors taking your DNA and submitting your information. Um, and so there are a lot of groups that are underrepresented in these, in, these group, in these companies, but they also have really good reason to be skeptical of what's going to happen to their DNA and um, how that might hurt them and their community later in, in, in the future. And another reason why this, these companies are a little bit hard, um, a little bit problematic is that they don't really define what ancestry means. So um, ancestry in these groups, does it mean... Does it mean 50 years ago? Does it mean 200 years ago? Does it mean 10,000 years ago? 60,000 years ago, um, uh, 300,000 years, we were all Africans at some point. And so it's very difficult to determine at what point are we talking about um, when we're defining ancestors, how far back do we go to talk about what ancestry is? So that's the end of my formal talk, but I wanted to, um, to give people plenty of time to ask specific questions. And I see that there's a few in the chat. So I'll just pop back on here just for a second to moderate the chat for Dr. Warren. That would be awesome. uh, I don't know that we have a lot of questions, but we do have some comments, the majority of them for me. Um, but we had one, one, one audience member comment. I remember years ago when Blacks would die and it was said they died from acute indigestion when it really turned out that they had high blood pressure. It didn't become an issue until later years when uh, Caucasians started having the same medical issues and they came up that people were actually having strokes related to high blood pressure. Um, so just maybe what, if you can give some commentary on that. I don't know enough specifically about that problem, but I do know that a lot of the medical, so this is, might not answer it directly, but it's something that I wanted to bring up anyway. Um, a lot of the medical de devices and the, the methods and the techniques were not designed for black people. They were designed often for human, for white people. And so for instance, they just found out in the middle of a respiratory infection pandemic, that blood pulsometers that you put on your finger to measure the, the blood oxygen levels do not read, they're inaccurate for black people because it's based on pigment. And so they were not developed to read oxygen levels in black people. And we are in the middle of a pandemic that, it, that highly disproportionately impacts people with darker skin. And so that is just horrifying to find out that that's the case. And also that they knew that that was the case and nobody thought that it was a good idea to fix it. Um, before we got ourselves into, I mean, it, it would have been important at any point in the past, but especially right now when um, reading people's blood oxygen is so incredibly important for determining what the course of, of care is in hospitals. Um, that was one of those moments where I just wanted to throw my, my coffee in, like, this is just 
ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And um, there's a lot of situations like that. Um, there's, uh, I think that there are kidney levels that are read to determine where somebody falls on the kidney um, registry to, to if, whether or not you can get a kidney. Um, uh, and the, the way that they calculate it is based um, mostly on people of European descent. And they just sort of like add a coefficient to estimate what it would be. Um, so it, it's not very accurate for um, African Americans in particular, but but the the fact that they they developed the method for determining where white people fall in the line, and they just come up with a coefficient to figure out where black people might fall. These these methods were not developed with everybody in mind, and that's extremely problematic. And it's really frustrating because now we know that, and um, I think that we have a lot of work to do to to make sure that medicine is for everybody. <laughs> And, and I think that that goes back to when we talk about systemic racism and leads right back to the your presentation there, that these are the systems that we all depend on. I mean, who can do anything without good health care? Mm -hmm. um, and these systems have not been set up to assist us. Uh, they've actually been set up sometimes to, to help provide us with mistrust. Uh, so I, <clears throat> it's, that leads right into that. Guys, we are so lucky to have Dr. Warren from the University of Kentucky. If you have any other questions or comments, please, now is the time to drop them in the chat and, and get this expert advice and or counsel um, on what's going on currently in our world. With uh, This was very interesting to me because a lot of times people think of race as it's the mainly the way that you identify somebody. I mean, let's be honest, when, when we approach someone, the first thing that we're going to say is, not that they're short or they're tall, um, but more than likely it's going to be that she was a black woman or she was a he was a black male. That's how we identify. So to to actually hear your presentation and and understand that race is is not even it's not even a scientific thing. It's actually just about more of your region of your ancestry. Very important. We have some questions coming in from the chat. Uh, we have somebody Beth Amy asked. So how do we change the narrative? So I think that, that is a loaded question, Miss Amy. <laughs> I think that um, one of the best ways is to increase diversity in all aspects of science. And so, you know, um, part of the problem is the way that we're educated in our schools and, and med school. But one of the ways that we change that is by changing who's doing the research and who's doing the teaching. And they've shown that in um, African American maternal health rates can increase, can, can it be improved by just having more African American doctors. And so one of the ways that we can change this narrative and to improve healthcare for everyone, I saw the next question, is by increasing diversity in, in medical schools. Um, but also just in general, people who are thinking and coming up with ideas, um, you need to not just have a bunch of old white men coming up with ideas because, because there's, you're, they're going to be reproducing the same ideas over and over again. And you need to have more people that will ask questions like, well, you know, if the pulse ox, uh, if the pulse reader isn't working for black skin, then how will we, why don't we invent a new way to do that? And so I, I think that really increasing diversity in, at all levels in science is really important, not just science, but that's where I focus. I mean, that, that's very true. I just, uh, just put in the chat there, representation matters, and that's across all boards. And we've got to do that from our very youngest people. We've got to expose them to careers like STEM. Um, and, and humanities and social behavioral sciences, because once we are there, then we can we can be at that table to make decisions for other people. And I think that that's very important. Um, so a quote by somebody that's very important to me, um, uh, su Supreme Court Justice that just passed away, women should women should be at the table of every decision that needs to be made. And that, that goes for minorities as well. At, at all levels, I think that like children's cartoons should should show yes. diversity in every way. And children need to see themselves in what they want to be when they grow up. So they should see black judges and black Absolutely. doctors. And because if it doesn't occur to you that you can do that, then you won't pursue it. So Absolutely. I always used to think that my mom was a crazy woman because when we would go shopping for Barbie dolls, she would never buy me. It would be very, very often, not very often that she would buy me white Barbies. She always wanted me to have black Barbies. And I didn't understand that until I got older because it, it matters. You know, mm -hmm. you, you want to see yourself as that beautiful image as well. Absolutely.
Well, Dr. Warren, I just want to thank you for being with us today um, and sharing your information. I think that these type of presentations are what are things that we can use as actionable items to help change the narrative, as has been said. We've got to arm ourselves with the information that we need to change the narrative. And these are the, exactly the type of presentations that we all need to be engaged in in order to help change that. So when you get this information, what I, what I would like for you to do is give it to someone else. You know, share this recording with somebody else so that they are there, they can be knowledgeable with you. Um, so with that being said, um, I will now turn the program over to the slideshow.